Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this very special event, which is to com commemorate the life and times of Professor Ray Bates, who passed away just exactly one month ago, in fact. So he's a huge loss to ICSF and to many, many scientists, and obviously, particularly to his family. Because he was so much a part of our life and, and our guidance in ICSF, we felt that it would be appropriate to do um, this event as a, a, a tribute to him. And we were very pleased to see that so many people wished uh, to um, come in and say a few words about his life and times and his science and uh, memories of, of things that happened uh, together in the past. And it's just amazing myself, the more we put the pieces together, um, Ray had such a wonderful life um, and was, was for sure not fully acknowledged for the tremendous um, things he did. And we hope this uh, event, uh, which I'm delighted so many people are attending, will bring the many facets of his wonderful life together and act as a wonderful tribute uh, to uh, Ray and uh, for all the Bates family. So welcome everybody to this very special event. Um, just to set things rolling, uh, David, if you'd maybe move the slide forward, um, just to give, first of all, a very, very brief overview of his life history. And then as the various people come in, they will talk about the various parts of his life. Ray was born in 1940, uh, and the, the Bates family are, are where um, farmers and fishermen, very much people of the sea and ships and boats in Kilmore Quay in County Wexford. In uh, 1958, he started in the local school and uh, really excelled from his young days, reaching, uh, achieving a gold medal with his uh, leaving the local school in 1958. Um, in 1962, he qualified with a BSc in physics in University College Dublin in the Merrion Street uh, buildings. He joined the first initially the sugar company in Ireland for just a year and then joined uh, the um, Meteorological Service of Ireland, as it was then called, uh, which is now Met Aaron. And he spent uh, quite some many years with them working through the ranks and rising in seniority. Obviously, um, he quickly wanted to further his education. So in uh, 1964, he went to MIT in Boston and achieved a PhD uh, under Jewel Charney um, in, in physics and meteorology. In um, came back then in 1969 to Met Aaron and um, Obviously, work forward became eventually a, a head of research and assistant director of them. In 1979, he went to Cairo, believe it or not, as a meteorological expert. And 1980, he worked with the meteorological organization in Geneva, World Meteorological Organization. Then came back uh, again to Met Aaron. And then in 1987, it just shows what a a wonderful man he was. He just didn't let the grass grow under his feet. He left and went off to the NASA Goddard Space Institute um, and um, became a senior scientist and branch head with them in 1987 up to uh, 1993 and achieved very significant awards from them also. He came back to Ireland, but then in 1995, he moved on to Denmark. Uh, to the Niels Bohr Institute, University of Copenhagen, where he was professor of meteorology. And uh, then uh, spent, I think, seven or eight years with them, came back to Ireland eventually in 2004, and then became adjunct professor of meteorology in UCD. And with that, um, uh, you know, broadened his interests into a whole lot of other things that we'll talk about. And um, he was with uh, Professor, adjunct professor, right up to his passing uh, uh, very early this year. And But he did many other wonderful things in 1978 to 81. He 
he was chair of the special uh, climate committee uh, in the uh, Centre for Meteorological Forecasting in Europe. So he's, uh, you know, and over his lifetime, he was always researching and uh, did a hundred or so papers. And, and so that's just a snapshot. But now I'd like to start calling in people who knew him in the various parts of his life. And uh, there's a list on the screen there. But we'll go through them one by one. And uh, it's up, uh, you know, there'll be short, just talks, maybe a couple of photographs. Uh, just talking about their memories of Ray and um, both in terms of him as a person and of his science. So I'd like to call in, if I may, uh, Vincent to start off, who is um, the former Alfred P. Lone Professor of Meteorology in MIT and a member of the U.S. National Academy of Science. So, um, Dick, we're extremely honoured that you're joining us and to give us a few words about the life and times, your memories of Ray. You know, a lot has been said already. I've known Ray since he came to MIT for his graduate studies. And as you mentioned, he, he was studying with Jewel Charney. And Jewel was a close friend, colleague and mentor for both of us. Jewel was also the leading figure in dynamics of the atmosphere and oceans. And at that time, this is, we're talking about the 60s, early 70s, it was considered that understanding the general circulation of the atmosphere was central to understanding climate. Indeed, Ed Lorenz, I hope people remember him as well, his major contribution to climate apart from chaos theory was his monograph, uh, The General Circulation of the Atmosphere. The basic notion was that heat transport by motion was important, was as important as radiative transfer in determining many climate regimes that characterize the Earth. This remains obvious, though generally it's an unrecognized truth, but Ray's work in climate always emphasized this. Of course, Ray's primary contributions were to tropical meteorology, forecasting, meteorology in Ireland and elsewhere, as you mentioned, including Egypt. And these have been gone into in detail in his obituary. I was, however, reminded of all of this when, Jim, when you referred to Ray's major contributions to climate science, and quite frankly, I could imagine Ray smiling at this. Ray certainly made outstanding contributions to many aspects of meteorology, but Ray was acutely aware that climate science was still primitive, that climate alarm was setting back our understanding profoundly. Ray understood that speaking of his holding operation, that's true of most of us, against religious the religious zeal of the alarmists, and considering that a major contribution was ignoring the fact that we still do not have an adequate understanding of terrestrial climate. While Ray was always the gentleman, and I personally felt rather conservatively inclined to value authority and expertise, he deeply resented the abuse of this trust by the zealots. With his death, of course, my wife and I miss Ray as a friend as well as a colleague. He stayed with us in Newton on his way to joining NASA, visited us in Paris, spent time with Ray in Dublin as well as in Kilmore Quay. There are, I think, some photos up of Ray in our apartment in Paris. Ray at a meeting in Bergen where both of us attended. But the one I find most interesting is Ray in Kilmore Quay. That perhaps is the real Ray. <laughs> At any rate, it is customary among Jews to wish that the deceased memory will be a blessing, and that certainly applies to Ray. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Wonderful, uh, wonderful thoughts. Uh, in that photo that's on the screen, uh, which you sent to us, the middle photograph of Ray waving, can you recall the context of that? No, that was at the meeting in Bergen, it was a meeting on climate when there still was room for both sides in it. So it had to be almost 20 years ago. And uh, 
He was just uh, greeting someone and probably saw me taking his picture. Lovely, lovely. Thank you very much, Dick. Okay. And if I may, I'll move on and ask uh, Will Happer to come in. Will is, as we all know, Cyrus Fogg, Brackett Professor of Physics Emeritus at Princeton University, a world leader in uh, atomic, molecular and all kinds of physics. Um, and Will, you have given us several excellent lectures and uh, I know um, you know you knew Ray very well. So if you'd kindly just give us your thoughts. Well, thank you very much for uh, the, the honor of speaking a few words about Ray, who I just tremendously admired. It's uh, on a solemn occasion like this, uh, you know, I often think about the words of the Roman poet, uh, Horace. Uh, uh, they're written here on the slide. And uh, an English translation is, I've built myself a monument more lasting than bronze. I shall not fully die. A large part of me will survive. And indeed, Ray's work in fluid dynamics will have a lasting and positive impact on our ability to make useful weather forecasts. You know, looking from the outside, Ray was an honest and creative scientist. He, he greatly improved the capabilities of numerical weather forecasting by developing practical computer algorithms to carry out Lagrangian analysis of fluid flow. And Ray co-evolved with digital computers. He came along just as uh, Moore's law was working and computers were getting better year by year. And he developed more capable software to get maximum benefit from the improved hardware. So, uh, as someone has already said, he never let the grass grow beneath his feet. He was widely recognized for this work, uh, most notably as the laureate of the Wilhelm Berkness Medal of the European Geosciences Union in the year 2009, a very well-deserved uh, honor. Ray's professional work focused on one of the hardest problems of physics. It's the motion of turbulent fluids you know, Werner Heisenberg, who invented the matrix uh, version of modern quantum mechanics, spent the final years of his life working on the theory of turbulent fluids. He was a very bright man. Uh, but he found this much more difficult than quantum field theory. And it really is. Uh, there's a nice anecdote about Heisenberg's response to an admirer's question uh, what would his soul ask the Almighty if the opportunity should arise after death? Uh, supposedly, Heisenberg said, I would ask God two questions. Why quantum mechanics and why turbulence? I think he will have an answer for the former. So both Ray... Bates and our friend Dick Lindzen have spent most of their lives working on the latter question, which Heisenberg thought was too hard for God. And they've done much to increase, increase our understanding of how Earth's atmosphere works. Ray's focus on Lagrangian methods, where one follows parcels of fluids during their complicated motions, was always very appealing to me because of its simplicity and uh, intuitive elegance. Uh, Heisenberg's contemporary, uh, Erwin Schrodinger, who invented the wave mechanical version of modern quantum mechanics, uh, spent many years of his life in Dublin after the Nazi Anschluss of his native Austria. One of my fondest memories is a tour of uh, Dublin with Ray who took me to see the Schrodinger Lecture Hall at Trinity University, or I guess I should say the former Schrodinger Lecture Hall, because even at that time, it had already been renamed the Physics Lecture Hall as a sign of disapproval of Schrodinger's interactions with women. Ray's uh, unflinching honesty 
in the current furor over, over climate was one of the most praiseworthy of his many admirable traits. Climate modeling of lurid catastrophes has been the bread and butter of the climate hysteria establishment. Ray could easily have multiplied his honest fame and fortune by predicting one disaster after another because of methane from Irish cattle or because of carbon dioxide from fossil fuels. But Ray would not take the bait. He remained steadfastly honest. He knew the limitations of computer modeling of weather and the even greater limitations of trying to model the climate many decades in the future. Ray uh, didn't simply grumble to his family about praised climate policies and what could have been a very comfortable retirement of sailing and enjoying life. He spoke up forcefully and effectively knowing full well that he would be subject to vicious demonization as a result. So let me close with a few more verses in honor of Ray, this time from the American poet Longfellow's Psalm of Life. So in the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb driven cattle, be a hero in the strife. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing, leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. So Godspeed, Ray Bates. Thank you. Thank you, Will. A wonderful, wonderful commemoration. Thank you indeed. Um, okay, I'll move on uh, to William Van Weingarten. Uh, if William, you've, um, as uh, many know, you've given us several lectures, full professor uh, in the physical department at York University in Toronto. Um, so you've given us several lectures and uh, which have been very important. And thank you for joining us this evening. And I give the floor to you. Well, good afternoon. Good evening. It is an honor to have been invited to speak briefly today at this memorial. I first met Ray several years ago when I visited Ireland to give a lecture at the Irish Climate Science Forum. It was my first visit to the Emerald Isle. Ray kindly took me to visit the University of Dublin. He also understood that with my Dutch background, water had an irresistible appeal. We drove along the Southern Irish coast he pointed out various sites such as a Martello Tower and explained Ireland's complex history. It was truly a delightful and memorable tour. Ray had an illustrious career in meteorology in both Europe and North America. In the field of climate research, he did pioneering work using computers for meteorological forecasting. Two things stood out when we spoke. First, he recognized the limitations of climate models. That really made him stand out as an exception in the field. Second, one could have a calm, rational conversation with him. Too often at climate meetings, anyone who questions the orthodoxy is not treated civilly. Ray was the inveterate gentleman. It is obvious that he was the ideal choice to lead organizations as he would be an ideal mentor to younger colleagues. Just a year ago, I returned to Dublin to speak at ICSF. The picturesque setting was at the Yacht Club overlooking the harbor. I was looking forward to speaking further with Ray. Through email, he had asked about the progress Will Happer and I were making to take into account cloud scattering of radiation. I was especially touched that he made the effort to attend the lecture. As I could see, and as he told me afterwards, he was not in the best of health. It is unfortunate that he did not have much time left. His loss to climate science is great, and all of us will miss him as a dear friend. I wish to express my sincere condolences to raise family. Thank you. 
Thank you, William. Wonderful words. Thank you. And I'll move on, if I may, to John Christie, um, who is Distinguished Professor of Atmospheric and Earth Sciences at the and Director of the Earth System Science Centre at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. John, you're very welcome. Well, thank you, Ray. And thank you all for this opportunity to acknowledge the influence on climate science of a true gentleman. I say gentleman because even as we take time to honor him today here in the U.S., we are dealing at this very moment with climate science at its most abhorrent manifestation with a federal trial, which was has demonstrated some of the meanest attacks scientists have made on those who, like Ray, were appalled at what had become of our field. Ray and I became acquainted through the keyboards of our computers as we contact as he contacted me several years ago with questions about our satellite data products. He was obviously well educated, I found out very quickly, as an atmospheric science with terrific questions about what the temperature of the earth was doing and how we knew it. Uh, as he became involved with climate issues, he was initially dumbfounded that some scientists could make statements that were demonstrably false. In one case, he and I discussed what to do about a colleague I knew very well who had falsely claimed that observations were showing a dramatic change in a particular variable. Ray challenged that person with real data and in the media was met with essentially slander, not evidence. This was not the way of a classically trained scientist like Ray who was schooled to approach questions and evidence with dispassion and objectivity. You kind of get that theme other people have also said here today. My wife and I were hosted by Ray and Jim O'Brien a few years ago as part of the Irish Climate Science Forum. Ray met us at the airport, and for the next few days, Ray and Jim served as gracious, friendly, and helpful tour guides. I suppose it was during those days where I could see his true natural instinct of approaching science with a substantial level of humility and awareness of our own ignorance about the climate system. He knew how to say, I don't know. As well, I could sense his conflicted soul uh, regarding the anti the science character of so much of what is labeled climate science today. However, he was able to deal with this conflict as he had managed with the help of many of you on this call to find a way to promote the scientific underpinning, underpinnings of the non-catastrophic evidence of climate variations and change. In the relatively short time I knew him, I believe he had come to grips with the situation we face, including the often unconscionable way some people act toward others. He understood that scientists were just people and people can say and do terrible things. However, he had found through you all an honest and effective way to make a positive contribution to the scientific method and the freedom of thought that attends it. So thank you, Ray, for being a thoughtful and true scientist, a gentleman and a friend. Thank you. Thank you, John, for those lovely words. Thank you indeed. I'll move on to Stephen Coonan. Uh, I think I see him on the screen. Um, uh, he was He's with the Hoover Institution in Stanford, uh, a leading theoretical physics a former, uh, worked at BP and under Secretary of State in the Obama in his administration. And he has uh, written a book, uh, which is a great one to read, uh, titled Unsettled, What Climate Science Tells Us, what it doesn't and why it matters. And Stephen, many of us have read that book and you've given us a great lecture as well. So uh, thank you for being with us this evening and I hand over to you. Thank you for the opportunity to say a few words. However much sadness is involved, I find memorial services fascinating. They invariably reveal so many things about the deceased that you'd wish you'd known while they were still with us. And so far, this gathering has been a disappointment in that regard. I don't recall ever meeting Gray in person, but Zoom screens are the least of what we shared. We both held PhDs from MIT, Ray about six years before me. And we both spent time at the Bohr Institute, Ray beginning his stint about 20 years after my time there. 
We also shared an interest in numerical methods for complex systems. Mine began with quantum many-body physics, coming only later to climate, where Ray spent his entire career. But most importantly, we shared a passion for getting climate science right and accurately communicating it to non-scientists, particularly decision makers. When you read Ray's writings and listen to his interviews, you see him doing that as a serious scientist should. A measured and dispassionate tone, a straightforward recitation of facts and data, and a highlighting of obvious implications. All of that would be unremarkable in almost any field of science. Unfortunately, it is unremarkable. It is remarkable, sorry, in climate science and in the related field of energy. Ray earned much opprobrium for speaking with integrity. For example, when the Global Warming Policy Foundation published his critique of an IPCC report in late 2018, Gavin Schmidt, a leading proponent of the consensus narrative, termed it a silly pseudo rebuttal of, to mainstream science. Basically a dialed in work for hire. It's inconsistent, incoherent, a little bit funny, and adds nothing to our understanding of the science. Now, whatever the substance of the dispute, and I have to admit I'm with Ray uh, on this one, Words like Gavin's have no place in serious discussions. As far as I knew, Ray took such criticism in stride, always the gentleman. In fact, he was something of a model for me as I've spoken out about the science and responded to the subsequent frack. So I wasn't surprised to learn that he much appreciated the book I wrote. You need only to follow the news to see that the energy transition now is running into difficulties. Those problems could have been and actually were foreseen several decades ago by anyone who'd studied the matter. They are, I think, those difficulties slowly bringing more realism to discussions of climate and to the madness of most forms of climate action. As we've already heard, Ray will be remembered for many things, but what's most salient for me are his pioneering efforts to set Ireland and the world straight on matters of climate and energy. What he did, and as importantly, how he did it, remains an inspiration for me, and I suspect for many others who've taken up that cause. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much for those words. Indeed, thank you. Um, I'll move on to uh, Peter Webster, if I may. Hey, Peter was the Georgia Institute of Technology, the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, uh, the College of Sciences. And Peter, I know you're an old friend, longtime friend of Ray's. Yes, I'm a long-term friend of, of Ray. Uh, uh, you know, what can you say about this man? He was a fine scientist a strong and a moral man, and a, a great friend. One of the great pleasures of my life has been knowing Ray for so many years. We were students together at MIT and would meet many times at meetings, and uh, we'd have the occasional beer together quite often, so uh, we had good of fun. Um, I would communicate with Ray, uh, especially Easter and Christmas time, and because I'd tell him about my latest version of Colken and Potatoes, that he introduced me to many, many years ago. And uh, so it was a lot of fun. And this year, uh, I was getting no answers later in the year, and I worried. And then I found out about his, his poor demise. We'd be deeply missed by all of us. And my, my condolences go out to his family and, and to Natasha, uh, who must feel his uh, loss the most. 55 years ago, Ray changed my life. Um, I was a young Australian uh, meteorologist, very junior, and I decided I wanted to get my PhD in the States. And I made the unfortunate mistake of applying to a, a university in the South, which was um, had a very, very different view of meteorology than I did. So I wanted to study uh, uh, theory and fluid dynamics of the tropics. 
So I applied for a summer fellowship at the National Center for Atmospheric Research on thermal convection that was accepted. That was in 1966. And I was uh, staggered at the accomplishments of the other students, most of whom came from MIT, and, and including Ray. And so he said, oh, you should talk to uh, uh, Jewel Charney. He's coming. I said, oh, my God, talk to the God. <laughs> and uh, so I had a chat with, with Charney. I told him what I wanted to do. And he picked up the telephone, dialed, and uh, uh, called the chair of meteorology at, uh, at uh, MIT and said, I have a new student, uh, Peter Webster, a ranger. And I was there. So we had a marvelous time in, in summer. And uh, uh, <clears throat> when I got to MIT, I, I had a great taste of, of Ray's diplomacy. Um, we, we, we used to like to, uh, we did many things together. And uh, one of them was that he, he wanted to sing uh, uh, a group singing um, for the Christmas party. And, and he decided on Nobis, on Nobis Domini. I said, oh, I know that. So can I join in? <clears throat> and he said, uh, of course. So we had a rehearsal. And then Ray took me aside and said, Peter, you perhaps have a fine Australian tenor voice, but not an Irish one. And I was eliminated from that. So <clears throat> anyhow, I, I was... Um, uh, last week, uh, uh, in fact, until yesterday, at a trial that's taking place in D.C. And one might call it the Climate Monkey Trial. It, it was pretty close to the most disgusting uh, parade of, of terrible untruths said about people. And, um, uh, and I have to say, I, I thought of the type of things that Ray has had to put up with during the uh, last few years. And he's, he, he came to mind... Uh, repeatedly. Um, so he would argue, of course, about uh, he, he, his foremost duty as a scientist is one of a skeptic and not a person of controlled and corralled thinking that seems to have gripped most of the, the world. Anyhow, he was an ethical, honorable man and strong of will and will be remembered for his stance. And so his mindset will prevail. I have no doubt about that. So Ray, thank you for you being part of my life, for being uh, uh, part of many lives and, uh, and a pervasive uh, sentiment among all of us. We're lucky enough to know you. Rest well, Ray, and thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. There are a couple of photographs, fascinating. Ah. Uh, they're on the slides. If you talk through oh, them, maybe. Of course. This is at uh, <clears throat> a subsequent meeting in 1972 on Dynamics of Tropical Atmosphere <clears throat> at NCAR. <clears throat> And this one uh, was from Judy Curry, who was a, an admirer also of, um, of Ray and understood very well the type of torment that he was undergoing from, from uh, uh, many, many parts of our field. And so uh, uh, Judy understood very well. Uh, she was uh, lambasted last week by some unscrupulous people. So anyhow, she, she's a great admirer of Ray. And, and, and shares in, in, in the loss. And the two other photographs, fascinating. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, of course. The one on the left here uh, shows Ray uh, talking to Dick Linton, a slightly younger Dick Linton, I might add. And the one on the right, uh, it's a picture of Ray. Uh, uh, one of the things about Ray is that he always had uh, posed very, very good questions, no matter what the topic. And uh, that was a, a memorable meeting. And uh, uh, Dick was in full flight and uh, Ray was in his full flight in his own way. So it was a very enjoyable time. Thank you. I love the haircuts and the spectacle <laughs> styles of those years. Yeah. Um, yeah. OK, thank you very much, Peter. Mm -hmm. um, I'll keep moving on. Um, unfortunately, Axel Valo Anson, um, uh, I, unless he managed to tune in, had a, he both had a medical problem at the last moment. Um, so I'll, uh, he did send me a, a, a speech, but uh, I'll we'll come back to that later, depending on timing. And in that context, if I might move forward to uh, Dr. Benny Pizer. Uh, who is director of the Global Warming Policy Foundation in London, um, the a great think, think tank 
uh, on on climate and energy matters. So, uh, Benny, if you'd like to come in. All right. Well, thanks for having me, Jim. Uh, obviously, I'm uh, not um, a colleague or a climate scientist, and I've come to know Ray from a completely different angle. I actually um, met Ray for the first time 10 years ago um, when the National Broadcaster in Ireland, in Dublin, um, broadcast a program on climate change um, where, where three Irish climate scientists spoke, including Ray, and I was invited mainly to talk about climate policy. And as the director of the Global Warming Policy Foundation, they invited me. And this whole program 10 years ago caused a huge brouhaha and um, criticism and uh, very angry green campaigners. And um, interestingly, the national broadcaster, RTE, in their response, and I quote, wrote, it is important that while we reflect the scientific consensus around any particular issue, that we are also prepared to reflect dissent. In the vast majority of cases, we feel that allowing both the consensus and the dissent to be heard, once both are given their proper weight, is our duty and responsibility. So it's, uh, you know, weird to think about that that was still possible 10 years ago. And Ray was heavily criticized for his own contribution to this program. But that was the day that uh, Ray and I met and I introduced him to the Global Warming Policy Foundation. And he was um, reluctant to, I invited him to become a member of the Academic Advisory Committee. He was reluctant to join uh, the GWPF uh, because he was under attack from green campaigners and it um, took him another six seven years before he joined eventually the global warming policy foundation mainly because papers that he offered to irish climate science uh, organizations refused to even put them through peer review and he realized that it was um, the only way of publishing some of his papers it was outside um, a, a circle of colleagues who were re reluctant to publish it. Um, he published three papers for the Global Warming Policy Foundation. Can you still hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead, please. Um, he published three papers uh, and... Um, when he was asked why he joined the GWPF but, 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 uh, by some green journalists, he said, the main reason I have for some time been positively disposed towards the GWPF is that he has given, that it has given me freedom to express my scientific viewpoint, a freedom that I do not otherwise enjoy. So, can you imagine one of the most kind of eminent climate scientists in Europe, uh, if not worldwide, unable to publish in the you know normal peer-reviewed journals because the editors had essentially closed down their journals for any scientific papers that went against the main alarmist um, viewpoint. So he was keen to still publish and uh, he also said he. Uh, what, another reason why he joined the GWPF was because the IPCC essentially totally ignored um, papers like his or that by Linsen and Choi that um, were less alarming. And so I think Ray, when he joined the the Irish scientific, uh, the Irish skeptic 
organization, and he became aware that his views were being um, attacked and his views were no longer being even accepted for peer review, um, he, he realized that we had to establish another um, public outing for, his, for publications, another public venue for critical views. And that's what we helped to provide for his papers in the last few years. And so, yeah, we had huge respect for Ray and for his work and his uh, brave move to, to fight his case. Thank you, Benny, very much. And uh, as you say, thank you for the opportunity of providing uh, a forum in which Ray could uh, write. And he did write very important uh, papers, such as the critique of the IPCC 1.5 degree report. And also he did work on um, uh, ice trends in the poles. Yeah. So he appreciated that indeed. Thank you. Um, Benny, I'll move on, if I may, to Nick Lewis. Okay. Thanks, Nick. Thank you, Jim. Uh, as some of you may know, I'm an independent climate scientist whose work focuses on the estimation of climate sensitivity. I only had the privilege of meeting uh, with Ray and interacting with him uh, towards the end of his life, sadly. Hence, my contribution will be shorter and less weighty than most of the preceding ones. I first became aware of Ray's work on climate sensitivity back in 2013, quite soon after I started studying this area. And I discussed his papers with others, other um, scientists uh, on several occasions over the next few years. Ray was doing valuable work investigating how climate sensitivity estimation using simple global energy balance models, it could be improved by dividing the globe uh, into two zones, the tropics and the extra tropics. In connection with that work, Ray also did an excellent job of highlighting problems with using, using global or general circulation climate models uh, to estimate climate sensitivity. Uh, I'm pleased to say that eventually in 2021, in its AR6 report, the IPCC finally came to accept that uh, global climate models should not be used to estimate climate sensitivity, uh, something they should have done a long time before. <laughs> in the event, Ray and I only made direct contact in early 2019, following a request by Benny Pizer uh, for comments on a paper Ray had written on deficiencies of the IPCC um, SR 1.5 um, report, the special report on 1.5 degrees. In September of that year, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Ray in person during a visit to Dublin uh, for the first time, uh, where I'd come to give a lecture on climate sensitivity at the uh, IS, ICSF. Um, I remember the occasion uh, of our meeting well. Uh, we had a very enjoyable, uh, stimulating and useful discussion about climate sensitivity and other important issues in climate science, like myself. Ray fully accepted the basic science underlying the climate effects of greenhouse gases, but doubted that they were as great as usually claimed. After that uh, uh, meeting, we remained in contact and exchanged quite a number of emails over the following years about a variety of matters. Um, Ray uh, put considerable efforts into making extensive review comments on the draft versions of the uh, IPCC AR6 report and asked me to have a look at them uh, for submission. Um, with, with, in particular, a, a view to spotting any po possible errors in them. Um, I uh, raised comments focused in particular on the treatment in AR6 of climate sensitivity, arguing um, that it disregarded evidence pointing to climate sensitivity being low uh, and giving undue weight uh, to evidence supporting high climate sensitivity. Uh, Ray's comments was of a very high standard, and I didn't find any errors in them, uh, to, um, unsurprisingly. Uh, unfortunately, it's a fairly thankless task uh, making comments on IPCC reports, as the uh, authors often brush, up, brush off um, critical review comments, even where they're valid, 
and unfortunately that was the case uh, it, with with Ray's comments. Um, I was enormously impressed by Ray's continuing de dedication to making a serious contribution to climate science at an age when most academics have long left their fields and by his willingness to go against the prevailing orthodoxy in areas where he considered it faulty. Ray exhibited great strength of character in going against the mainstream characterization of climate change as dangerous and in questioning claims made by the IPCC and many uh, other scientists. I would like to point out in particular that in my view, Ray showed considerable bravery in joining the GWPF's Adv Academic Advisory Council in 2021, uh, which uh, tends to attract uh, fairly vitriolic attacks from other scientists. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nick, uh, for those very kind words. Thank you, indeed. Uh, Matt, yeah, welcome. Great. Matt, Matt is from the Irish Farmers Journal and a, Ray, a, fr a long time friend of uh, Ray's through um, uh, Chagas, the Irish Agricultural Research Association and the Royal Dublin Society. So um, I know Matt, you had a long time uh, a friendship with Ray, so delighted to have you with us. Please thank you ahead. and good evening. And thank you. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to join such a distinguished gathering to pay tribute to Ray Bates. There is a saying that no man is a prophet in his own country, but this in fact was not true of Ray Bates. The church in his hometown of Kilmore Quay was packed for his funeral mass. Talking to some of them afterwards, he was fully recognized by his neighbors for the outstanding international scientist that he was. They were aware of his work for NASA, his role in the renowned MIT, his professorship in Copenhagen, as well as his membership of the Royal Dublin Academy, the Royal Irish Academy. And they knew that all of this did not come by accident, but by dint of his scholarship and scientific capacity. From my own point of view, I got to know Ray, especially during my time as editor of the Irish Farmers Journal, and laterally as chairman of the parent company, the Agricultural Trust. The Farmer's Journal, for those of you abroad, is by some distance the largest selling agri-publication in Britain or Ireland. And we have a responsibility to cover agriculture's perceived role in climate change as comprehensively and as honestly as we could. And when that was reaching a crescendo uh, of, of opposition and disapproval uh, among the wider community, Ray did a series of scientific articles for us in layman's language in the Farmer's Journal on the actual role of methane, which was held up as the main culpable gas. He dealt with it as a greenhouse gas, pointing out for the first time its short half-life compared with carbon dioxide, as well as the differing ways of measuring it, where he agreed with Professor Miles Allen of Oxford and Professor Frank Mitwelder of Davis both of whom brought a much more realistic appreciation of its role in global warming. Ray, from our point of view, did not deny that some global warming was taking place, but he analysed much more clearly and thoroughly than others, at least in Ireland, the likely effects of increasing carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. And he also contested the science behind some of the modelling work in the earlier IPCC reports. And I gather that these were subsequently, in fact, amended by the IPCC. From the RDS point of view, the RDS, again, for those that don't know, was the first to bring in radium for the treatment of cancer from Paris by Madame Curie. And we distributed it to the Dublin hospitals. I was president of the society at the time, and Ray was a, committee, a member of the Committee of Science and a member of the council. And he played a prominent and so constructive a role in both. There's no doubt we will miss Ray, his deep scientific knowledge, his willingness to share it, his unfailing courtesy, and his easy affability. May he rest in peace and our sympathies to Natasha and the entire family. And thank you again for the opportunity, Jim. Thank you, Matt, for those very kind words and uh, truly uh, appreciating and you know his his work which uh, really was uh, very important to the agricultural sector in Ireland as it is uh, in all other countries thank you Matt again uh Philip O'Payne I'm just 
giving another call. Are you on the line anywhere? I don't think so. Um, I have a few other written uh, statements, but I think I'll open it up to any others that might wish to say a few words from the wider audience here. And um, I did see Tom Sheehan. I know I'm catching you perhaps unawares. Tom, if you... He's not uh, got his sound on, maybe. Uh, any now. others that, that, that wish to come in just to say a few quick words, please raise your hand. Donny. Um, just want to say that my first contact with Ray uh, was when I, when I approached him, I suppose it was about maybe four years ago, with my ideas about disseminating the true climate science to the public using television. And he quickly dissuaded me of that idea. So that was my first piece of education from the way, obviously based on rich experience. My first opportunity to get to know Ray was at a local farmers meeting in Mitchellstown in November of 2021, where Ray presented a talk uh, and the title was Not a Climate Crisis. And I could see that the audience, mostly farmers, were amazed with the content of the talk. And in the question and answer session that followed, half of the questions were directed that way. And people couldn't understand, couldn't understand why they never heard this message before and why they hear the opposite message all the time on television. Following the meeting, Ray mixed with the other speakers and the organizers in a most convivial manner. He was well able to mix with the people and patiently explain aspects of meteorology and climate without becoming overbearing or adversarial. He was always available to answer questions with patients. We have, I believe, lost a great scientist. A great person has been among us. And I feel enriched by his acquaintance. May you rest in peace. Thank you very Thank much, you very Donald, much. for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and another person who could not attend um, was uh, is John Butler, who is a former director of the Armagh Observatory, and he had a huge respect uh, for Ray over many years. And I'll just read his message. I was saddened to hear of deaths, uh, Ray's death recently, not just because we have lost a sincere friend, but also because I feel that his contribution to our understanding of climate change has still not been fully recognised. Ray did not hesitate to point out where he saw weaknesses in the canonical interpretation of climate change, particularly in the reports of the IPCC. Although great progress has been made over recent decades in our understanding of the climate system, Ray and some other scientists have consistently maintained that our computer models of climate are not complete. Much work remains to be done, particularly when we try to link the micro and macro physical processes in the Earth's atmosphere. One such area is the physics of cloud formation, uh, where our understanding is, of, is still um, uh, of micros microscopy and in cloud formation needs to be a lot clearer uh, and to understand the implications for the global radiation balance. Ray's contribution in reassessing the degree of warming expected from changes in carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere has wide implications for industry and agriculture, both in Ireland and globally. Because the implications of his work conflicted with the canonical view, Ray received some totally unfair and sometimes malign criticism in the press from people whose scientific credentials were greatly dwarfed by Ray's. Ray, like many scientists who have stepped away from the canonical line, including such illustrious names as Galileo, Darwin and Einstein, has shown how science progresses, not through a passive acceptance of current beliefs, but by original and often lonely scientific endeavour. Long may his independent spirit 
inspire the scientists of the future. Ah, uh, Philip, Philip, welcome. I come in if you can. Uh, yes, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Philip. Uh, Good to hear you. Uh, to speak. But Please go I've, ahead. I, I've written that. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Good. I've written out on three pages my homage to Ray. My first encounter with Ray, internationally esteemed academic, meteorologist and climatologist, was in the early 1970s when Ray had returned to Met Aaron from MIT. He had earned his PhD under Professor Jules Charney in September 69. I was very happy to find his thesis on the web dynamics of disturbances on the intertropical convergence zone. And it's clear that the thesis belongs to the tradition of mathematical physics developed over several centuries, largely in the German world and culminating in the 1930s Bergen School of Meteorology under Professor Willem Björknes. And I have a reason for saying that, which will become clear in a minute. In the early 1970s, the School of Mathematics in Trinity College, Dublin, invited Ray to give a series of lectures on the mathematical physics of meteorology. My thesis supervisor and head of department at that time, the hydrologist and hydraulic engineer, Professor Jim Duke, had received an invitation and he insisted that I come too. Jim's curiosity was driven by the esteem in which he held MIT's luminaries, Jules Charney and Peter Eagleson, the latter an engineer with hydrological interests similar to Jim's. My notes on Ray's lectures are long gone, but I recall with fallible memory Ray's meticulous derivation in the language of the calculus of the equations of motion of a planetary atmosphere in both inertial and rotating reference frames. I recall his discussion of periodic solutions, traveling or standing waves. He showed how to change the equations, replacing the linear vertical axis with an atmospheric pressure coordinate, how to exclude acoustic waves traveling at the speed of sound, and how to simplify them to two dimensions to yield the so-called shallow water equations, a test bed for analytical and numerical techniques for solving more general cases. The two hydraulic engineers in the audience, namely Jim Dugan and myself, were particularly interested in, in the shallow water equations. But we also learned we had to expand our toolkit by subsequently attending the lectures of David Judge on Courant and Hilbert et al. in the Department of Mathematics in UCD, lectures that Ray had very probably taken as a senior undergraduate some years earlier. In the late 1980s, Encounters with Ray increased. Jim Duke had won a research contract with the EU Climate Research Program to develop models of the hydrological cycle on land. The models, models are of the, the models, the ultimate clients uh, were the global climate modelers of the participating laboratories in Bracknell, Paris, possibly Potsdam and Hamburg computational efficiency and physical realism were competing objectives in our work. The perfect model did not exist, so the question was, how good is good enough in our attempted merger of meteorology and hydrology? Ray's views were always soft whenever he visited Dublin. We valued his counsel. The most significant prize Ray won was the 2009 Willem Björknes Prize of the European Geophysical Union, 
one of the largest scientific societies in the world. Seven years later, in 2016, in his paper in Earth and Space Science, on estimating climate sensitivity using two zone energy balance models, he wrote, the central conclusion of this study is that to disregard the low values of effective climate sensitivity of the order of one degree C given by observations on the ground that they do not agree with the larger values of equilibrium or effective climate sensitivity given by GCMs, while the GCM themselves do not properly represent the observed value of the tropical radius of response coefficient. And the, now we come to the punch, is a standpoint that needs to be reconsidered. It's a complicated sentence. It, a bear, it bears reading several times. But in my reading of it, in this very downbeat sentence, Ray is taking sides with Einstein. Models should be as simple as possible, but no simpler, which is a form of the philosophical principle of Occam's razor. In contrast, the enormous global climate models with their attendant supercomputers and thousands of tuning parameters are founded on the belief that more and more physics in the GCM implies better skill at prediction. Ray disagreed. So too did Jim Do. In the eight years since the publication of this result, the scientific establishment has failed to welcome the good news that the effect of climate sensitivity to a doubling of CO2 is roughly one degree C. It implies there is no climate crisis. Ray, unfortunately, was abandoned to the truthiness of the postmodern media. Moral hazard reigns. And my final paragraph, I asked Jim Doog shortly before he died in 2010 why there was no experimental program in the WMO UNAP World Climate Program. No CERN-like organization with experimental facilities to study, for example, radiation effects in clouds at field scale using giant columns. Controlled experiments, after all, are the gold standard of the scientific method. Jim replied, ah, Philip, it went political very early. So to end, I say, I salute you, Ray. I treasure your memory. I send greetings to your family. Horsemen, drive on. End of my homage. Thank, Thank you for you. your attention. Thank you, Philip, for your very kind words. Much appreciated as uh, um, former Dean of Engineering in, in Cork University. Uh, much, much appreciated. Thank you. Anybody else wish to come in with any few words? Jed. Jed van der Poel. Uh, hi. Um, I, I haven't known Ray that long, maybe 10 years. I think I met him in the uh, uh, about uh, 2014. And uh, together with uh, with Jim, uh, we we ended up founding the uh, uh, the ICSF. But uh, I would consider myself very much the the junior partner in uh, in the organisation, uh, certainly from an educational point of view. Uh, but people have talked a lot about Ray as a as a gentleman, but uh, but he was also a, a very a very kind man. Um, we we would meet um, for lunch uh, once a month, uh, uh, one time on the on the south side of the city, one time on the north. Um, uh, and uh, until I, um, I I fell ill in um, in twenty uh, twenty two, and then religiously he would he would call me every week to check up how I was uh, how I was doing how I was getting on, and uh, uh, it was some something of a, a an irony that uh, he used to he described me as the miracle man. Uh, in terms of uh, managing to uh, uh, 
uh, survive <laughs> the uh, uh, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune for the last couple of years. So very very sad that uh, that I, I should be the one um, uh, standing by uh, by his deathbed rather than than him by me. Uh, so um, he he was certainly a, a great scientist, uh, a gentleman, uh, and a, a good friend to to many. But uh, uh, but certainly, I think something that uh, that will stay with me. He was uh, a very a very kind man, and uh, I would uh, uh, like to leave you all with with uh, with that image of him. Thank you. Thank you, Jed, for those very kind words. Um, yeah, it's uh, and strangely, um, I'm how I came to meet Ray myself. It was back in 2015. Um, I'm a, an engineer, electrical engineer. I worked uh, in, in the building materials business. In my final year before retiring, the board wanted a report on climate change. So I read up the books and began to think, hey, there's more to this than what's in the media. But anyhow, they the story there was uh, use be as energy efficient as possible and make more money. That was the end of that one. But I kept up that interest in my retirement and uh, in participating, one area I was interested in was energy efficiency. And I was very fortunate to be elected to the Irish Academy of Engineering. And we were doing various uh, studies on energy efficiency. But I could see behind all this that there was very little understanding of climate science. So I put together a paper um, which, in you know, summarized all sides of, of the story and brought this to the academy. And they sort of raised eyebrows that this, the, hey, what's going on here? So they thought, look, what we'll do, and hoping to fob me off, sent me, we know a guy called Ray Bates, who's very much up to speed on all of this. So they sent me off to Ray Bates and I sent him a copy of my paper. So we met up for a coffee and he said, oh, this is great stuff. <laughs> and uh, so we immediately became friends and sat down and polished up the report. And, uh, you know, a few further cups of coffee later, we decided uh, that we really in Ireland needed a forum where the alternative views on climate science might be studied and disseminated and that's uh, how ICSF was born and uh, you know it was Ray brought the expertise far beyond any of our knowledge but uh, we uh, still continue with the good fight and uh, it is a big challenge and uh, you know Ray was the inspiration and uh, that was in 2015 and I uh, knew Ray ever since then very well and very fortunate to not just as a scientist, but as a gentleman and, and as a confidant and advisor and supporter. And um, it was all part of uh, the life with Ray. Um, so I, I, if there's nobody else jumping to come in, uh, maybe I'll ask Brian Sweeney to um, say a few words uh, towards wrapping things up. If, if I could, Matty McGray here. Oh, Matty, you're very welcome. And um, sincere apologies for being late. I just could not open the link for... Uh, Matty, just point. introduce yourself. You're a politician, aren't you? Matty McGray, I'm a TD uh, for Tipperary Rural Independent. And Great. I want to, first of all, to express my sympathies and that of our group to raise family and your and your co colleagues, yourselves there, on his untimely demise. I only met him the once. Uh, he came to the, 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 the doll in Ireland, met our group with some of his colleagues that have spoken there. And it was a very, very, very enlightening meeting. And of course, you know, he was kind of, I'd say shy, but didn't really want any limelight because of the way he was being, you know, not, not supported, you know, for his views. But any of us that have any questions about climate change or taboo with the media and whatever. So, they like to deride it. So it was a very, very interesting and inspiring meeting. And I was shocked to hear he was seriously ill and then of his passing. So just want to thank him for what he'd what he done. And hopefully we'll keep up the links with your organization, with our group, because we need that expertise and guidance. We're being bombarded all the time, 
you know, in the Dáil and everywhere you go. But we need we need the alternative view, and and it's a shame that there wasn't hardly a word about his passing. A man of such several state and and you know such knowledge and experience, and and look, maybe we'll rectify some time. But you know, he went <laughs> on the wrong side of. You know this this whole battle regarding climate change, and it's, it's sad, but he definitely was a wonderful, inspirational man. That the time, one time I met him, and hopefully I will, will continue in honor of his legacy to 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 collaborate and cooperate with yourselves in your organization going forward. Ari Strayk over and over and I'm Delish. Thanks very much. Thank you, Matty. The wonderful words, are much appreciated, and and yes. We hugely appreciate being understood by some of our um, uh, TDs or, or members of the Irish Parliament and in looking after. Uh, I mean, it's all we are all for sustainability, but my goodness, the things that are now beginning to happen are literally uh, closing that beginning to have severe economic negative effects. And, yes. Uh, in that context, I would just mention briefly, there was a very kind message from Verona Murphy, who is the independent uh, member of parliament from the Wexford area. She sent in a, a very nice appreciation of, of Ray's work as well. Um, I believe, Michael Connolly, did you have a hand up? Yes, yes. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um... I, I have been listening to the whole thing. Unfortunately, I was driving. I've just got back to the house now, which is why I couldn't comment before. But uh, yes, um, I, I, I knew Ray's brother, um, Dick, for uh, a good many years. But I first met Ray um, on a primetime debate uh, on the radio tele or on RTE. Uh, where myself and Ronan and Ray had been invited to represent one side of the uh, uh, climate uh, narrative. But uh, uh, Friends of the Earth and a number of other people protested, and in the end, the producer said that we would have to just choose one person to represent our side, as it were. And so Ray uh, fulfilled that role. But... Um, Ray was a fairly cautious man, and uh, we had a discussion after uh, after the show. And uh, a short time later, I heard that from from some of the professors in Trinity that I was associated with that he made inquiries from them uh, as to whether or not I was <laughs> a, a, a trustworthy person, and so. He actually then, on the basis of that reply, he contacted me. And as you know, then, uh, Jim, uh, he he asked us if we would be interested in forming uh, some organization. And he uh, arranged a meeting with you and with Jed uh, and myself, Ronan and Amela, uh, out in the Royal Marine Hotel, where we set up the Irish uh, Climate Science Forum. But... Um, all through the entire length of time, even though we, we got too busy to be able to do much there, uh, I had, con about once a month, I would either get a call from Ray or I would ring Ray to discuss various different scientific uh, um, things. But again, I the one thing I can say about him is that he was very thorough. Whenever I gave him something that I had to review, he would insist upon taking about two months to go right through the whole thing. And uh, that was the one thing about him. So when he did say something, you knew it had a lot of thought behind it, you know. So I really appreciated uh, his stuff. And then again, he would give me his papers to go through as well. So, you know, uh, he's going to be sadly missed. That's all I can say. And my condolences to all his family. That's it, really. Thank you, Michael, and, and thank you for all of the, the work you and and Ronan and Imelda have put in on the whole uh, climate side. Uh, mm -hmm. Wonderfully. Thank you very much. I'll move on to Brian, um, the, our, our chair, our guidance within the ICSF. Brian? Good evening, folks. <clears throat> 
First of all, I would like to express my deepest sympathy with Natasha and the extended family of Ray's. They are the victims of an early bereavement, must be saddened very strongly by anguish and, and missing the magnificent companionship of Ray. Having had the experience of sudden or nearly sudden bereavement myself, I can sympathize them with them to a certain extent. And I would hope that with the passage of time and the intervention of the good Lord, their sadness and loss will be ameliorated by the years. Ray, I counted as a friend of mine. Like Jim, I'm a poor engineer. He and I and a number of others were described in the derogatory terms as not being capable of understanding anything about climate change because we were only engineers, which I thought was kind of flattering in the end. Now, being a friend of, of Ray's, it's only going back maybe four, five, six years, we had two things in common immediately. He, he sailed and he lived, really his family lived in Dunmore East. And we could talk about the adventures of sailing and particularly the anxious times that I had on occasion trying to navigate into Kilmore Key, taking the shortcut. But I recognized immediately that I was dealing with a superior being. And for me, the epitome of everything about Ray was his intelligence, his integrity, his honesty, and his commitment. And this was all cloaked in a personality that was modest and never overbearing. And as somebody who might be known for speaking too much, I tended to listen more to Ray than I would to a lot of other people. I had the height of respect for him and Ni Vega Lejeda Risaunga Joe. They say that character is the footprint of the soul. That being the case in Ray's build up, he left a very deep and wide and impressive fingerprint globally, I would suggest. And his output, his cooperation with so many of the wonderful people we have here paying tribute to him this evening was amazing, but never overbearing, as I say, cloaked in a modest approach. Einstein said that information is not knowledge. And my God, what we have to deal with today in information, or maybe I should say misinformation. It's all the more important that we had a star of integrity and knowledge and competence to refute in a non-aggressive way what he saw to be patently unimpossible and implausible. Ray, as a, a man of huge reputation and impact in the world of knowledge and science throughout the world, will be magnified, his reputation will be magnified and amplified into the, into the future and presents a golden opportunity to exploit his profile as an inspiration to our undergraduates, graduates, and postgraduates, and would make him worthy to be part of the ranks of the world scientists that we have in Ireland. And I feel that the greatest tribute that we can pay to Ray is to continue the efforts of our little organization to promulgate honest, progressive science rather than kowtowing to the tsunami of misinformation uh, and dangerous concepts that are generally accepted by the public at large and by a number of other people who should know better. So therefore, I have to say, I was proud of Ray. We can all be proud of Ray. His contribution to the world of science and knowledge are remarkable. And I would say, requiescat in pace, ni vega God bless you, Ray.
Thank you, Brian. Uh, words to limit with such emotion. I, I, I can see it in people's faces. It's it's uh, quite extraordinary. And uh, I mean, it's, as you said, Brian, it's that's why ICSF must keep going and we will do. And um, with the support of so many of our ex real scientists around the world. And uh, I think this uh, this particular event has um, brought it all together and, and given us even more strength to continue on and, and to sadly, very sadly miss Ray. But I think in a way his legacy is is even more stronger now and uh, will uh, motivate us to keep going and to keep doing um disseminating real science and and uh, to battle against uh, the wild world out there uh, yeah i can't say any more I, I think this tribute has has brought out so much so much positive and uh, i hope Ray is listening in. I'm sure he is. And uh, he lives in our memory. And uh, we'll work forward and continue the work of ICSF. And uh, thank you all so very, very much for participating. Um, to end this session, this session, one other facet of Ray's life is that his love of music. And he used to sing in the Goethe uh, choir here in Dublin. Um, and I never heard Ray singing, but obviously he must be, when you hear this piece, it's pretty odd stuff. So Ray could could hit the right notes. And uh, um, you'll see him later in the video at the, he's at the back left hand, second from the back uh, amongst the other singers. So I'll conclude this session if David uh, can uh, tune in and put us on to that. Uh, um, great uh, piece of music a very fitting end and thank you all for participating and Ray thank you for everything
Thank you all. See you soon again for our next lecture in March. Bye for now.